Ah, hi. Oh, I don't have sound. Hmm. I don't have sound for you. Do you have sound for me? No sound. Camera, mic, hello. I just can't hear you. So I can't hear anything. <laughs> Hi. My sound is on camera mic. No, I'm. I can't hear you. I'm having issues. <laughs> hmm. Everything's on. Well, I can say, I can wave. Oh dear. And there you go. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> so we can talk to each other. <laughs> Has he turned his mic on? Is his mic turned off? Michael, is your, is your mic on? Did he mute himself? I don't know. I know we will have to go. Let's see. Matt, where's where he go? Oh well. Hi Jerry. Hi Annie. <laughs> How are you? Have you heard anything uh, from Marine? I have not heard anything. Well, I, I talked to Maureen last month, but I haven't talked to her recently. Um, she is amazing. She's out in California. Well, gosh, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I haven't heard anything since the fire. So. Well, she had to evacuate. Oh, okay. Do you hear me? Matt. Oh, yes. Okay. Hi. Hey, how you doing? How are you doing? I'm 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 fine. I'm, I'm glad to have you both um aboard. I'm I'm sorry to hear about Maureen though. I'm I may, I'm Wendy told me about why she couldn't come aboard today. Yeah, we were just talking about that. I just heard about it from Wendy, and uh, I guess it was a forced evacuation. They're making everybody leave. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so you know she's got a dog and everything. And yeah, she's got animals. And oh. Wow. And, wow. and her son is there, right? She's I'm hoping to hear from her sometime today via Wendy, probably. Okay. Wow. It's it's pretty bad. Um, yeah. I'm going to be praying for her, though. So I've, I've been praying for her all night, her and her family, that hopefully she'll be okay. Because it's been, it's been on the news about the fire that's going on out there. So I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, she was a part of that. Yeah. yeah. Um. So Liz, we, we did an interview a few months ago over the phone, and now this is my first time doing a visual interview yeah, with yeah. you. And, <laughs> and Jerry, I've, I've been trying to interview you for a long time, man. I was a fan of Ross Marley. I, was, I told Liz that um, I was a fan of Guy and Light since back in 2000, when I was back in, in third, second grade. For many years, I watched the show. I recorded the show. Um, I was disappointed when you when they let you, let you go and you went to One Life to Live, but I watched you on One Life as Clint until that ended. And but I'm, I'm a huge fan of Guy and Light, and I'm currently working on a documentary about the show, how it began until the very end. Oh wow! Yeah. In 2000, tell me how old were you? What grade were you in? Come on, make it feel old. <laughs> what grade? I was. I was like eight or nine years old at the time, and um, I even remember um, 
Beth, Beth Chamberlain, who was Beth Rings, um, she had just married Edmund and was trying to escape from the towers and the rope snapped and she fell. And because I was young, I didn't know TV magic, so I thought she was dead. And <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know TV magic at the time. And um, my first storyline with you guys was they y'all was doing the Tory storyline where she came on the show. And right. next thing I know, <laughs> <laughs> the next time I was off school, she yeah, was holding it. she was holding Blake in this in this dungeon, and then she had you in the tub, bro. I was trying to drown you. <laughs> yeah, it was all crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 What, did, what did your mom watch or something or someone? Yeah, yeah. She she's been a fan for a long time, and. Um, uh, why I watched God and Light? Well, I guess it was an escape for me. Um, I don't know. We talked about this before, Liz, but um, as a kid, I was I was bullied a lot because of my weight. I was a little bigger than how I am now, and my mother and me was just it was just us. So what I ended up doing was I ended up writing all the time as a kid, and watching. I first watched Young and the Restless. And I was like, okay, you got a couple in the boardroom, in the bedroom. What the heck is this? What is a soap opera with couples making out in the boardroom, in the bedroom? What is this? <laughs> then I watched As the World Turns, and then that's when I got on God and Light. And it was just something about God and Light that just, it, it drew me. And unlike YNR or As the World Turns, where they always change cast all the time, you guys kind of stayed the same. Y'all had Y'all stayed there for a long period of time, so... That's why I got hooked in the guy. I'm like, <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. That's just yeah. wonderful. I'm glad um, we were all together. <laughs> for you. Yeah. Um, how are you guys holding up during the pandemic, though? Both of y'all. Yeah, is it any different for you? I mean, because. <laughs> Nothing much has changed for me. No. My guess is you're just kind of yeah the same. Well, we'll go by here. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing now? What what? What are you doing? Oh well, I'm. You know, it it's starting to go back with precautions and safety. Um, Keeper's back at Rice. He's in Houston. Um, so my son is, is back at, at 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 school. He's a junior, and uh, but he's living off campus with a, a group of, of people, so they they can control their environment and their food, and they're and they're being very responsible to each other. And um, he can walk to campus. He only has to go a couple times a week, so he's kind of getting himself set. And um, you know, poor my poor daughters, like you know, Bella's in the middle of trying to get a job in this pandemic. So um, although, yeah. cross your fingers, she's got a a final interview today for um, Texas State University to, to oh, be a photography lab manager. So, um, you know, I might have both kids in Texas. What up with that? What happened? <laughs> Where did that happen? I'm a California girl that moved to New York. <laughs> wow. You're away from the Gulf Coast. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, we're, we're doing, you know, we're doing okay. It's, 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 it's not bad. It's not. Numbers aren't bad in my area and and of, of New York, and um, everybody is very supportive, and um, so I'm not I'm not facing those difficulties that other you know other areas might be challenged with. You go shopping, right? I do the shopping. I go shopping like I try to make it twice a week, and I've got it down. I've got the shopping down. So um um, and I and I. And I go during hours where it's not terribly crowded. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm now getting used to it, which is a little scary. Like I'm, I'm just—I used to feel like I was armored up, like I was going to go to war, and you know, just to get out of the house. And now I'm—I'm I'm just I'm so used to the mask and the washing of my hands, and, and you know, yes, yeah. a way of life now. How are you doing, Jerry? Good. Uh, I don't go to the grocery store m at all. We have uh, a service, you know, <laughs> and we leave it on your front porch. And, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. The other day I went to I went to Costco. That was very dangerous of me. Uh, but it, yeah. we're, so, we're so together in Costco. I mean, it's like walking into a hospital ward. It's like you yeah. know, everything's sanitized and everybody's can't get in without a mask. And they've got sanitation throughout the aisles. And, and they, they they no longer give away free food <laughs> because the tasting stations are too dangerous. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, um, it was interesting because Kiefer said that the air the airline was great going to the going through the airport in the LaGuardia was like you didn't have to touch anything and he kept everybody apart and um, he felt very safe, which was yeah good. Yeah. So. Oh. Um, well, you know, the, the through it all, I mean, at least you know, we're still broke. You know, we woke up this morning, and you know, we're taking it day by day, and um, hopefully, between now and sometime next year, we'll see what happens with this pandemic. Yeah. <sighs> So, I, I feel bad for all the restaurants in town. You know, just I mean, that's something I I completely have stopped. I just, in fact, today is our anniversary. Is Bobby and uh, it's our twenty fourth anniversary today. Anniversary. Yeah, but they, <laughs> we, we didn't even think of going to a rest. We're doing, we're like, oh no no no, we're just gonna be, it's like that that part I haven't. I kind of clicked on thinking that that's okay in my head. And I, and I feel bad for all my friends who run restaurants and cars and things because it just feels like perhaps that's like, you know, they're losing a lot of business. But, yeah. Hey, we're, 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 we're empty nesters now. <laughs> so we're just happy to go to, like, go to sleep by 930. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jerry, I got a, a, a clip. I got a clip for you on my phone. I, I got some clips of uh, the both of you on my phone, uh, Blake and Ross moments. And this is actually your very first episode with Michael Zaslow right here. If I can get my phone just right. <laughs> oh yes. Jerry, can you talk about your first day back in 1979? Were you were you nervous when you first joined the show? Yeah, yeah, that was April, I think, of '79, and uh, mm -hmm. it was like a, an event because they hadn't had a new character come on in about five years. I was walking into this uh, insulated place. You know, everybody has been there for at least five years. I've never been there. Ten Tolder and Sharid had been there forever, so uh, it was it was kind of nerve wracking in that they were you know, like being in a zoo. Everybody was staring at you like you were some sort of uh, a new uh, animal coming to the zoo, and it was like very strange. And and in those days, we actually had rehearsal. I mean, you had a dry rehearsal, which meant where. Uh, uh, you'd show the cameraman what you were doing, and then you'd actually have uh, a dress rehearsal, and then you had notes. So it, went, it went on for a long time, and the scenes were long too. The scenes were like five and six pages long, and over the years, all of that got compressed. You didn't. We got to the point where we didn't have. We had dress rehearsal, but they put it on tape. We had a dress rehearsal on tape, and if it was good, they'd buy it. So uh, they did that to live in themselves a lot. You know? We, we did a lot of our dress rehearsals on tape. A lot of times they bought them. And so to look back on 1979, even I remember I had one scene where I didn't even talk. I came into um, Justin Marler's house. He wasn't home. He was at the hospital. And his wife was there. Later on, I made a pass at her. 
But I have the person, and she, comes, she comes in. <laughs> I'm going to go get the coffee ready. So she leaves the set, and the camera just follows me to walk around the room. Must have lasted for almost a minute, watching somebody think as I look at all their knickknacks and their artwork and their family photos and everything. And there was no doubt that would never happen. <laughs> yeah. You're not allowed to think. That's amazing. And you were, oh gosh, yeah. just to see that, the two of you, you were babies. Oh, wow. I mean, that's really close to when I started watching the show. By the way, I probably was getting ready for my prom April of 79, just so you know. Just, just saying. I swear. Mm. <laughs> yeah, very, very sad. <laughs> Well, who knew that uh, two decades later you'd be joining the show at that point? <laughs> oh gosh, uh, yeah, that, uh, was, yeah. that was yeah, that was that was really wonderful because really it's the only show I've ever been a fan of. I, I'm, you know, Matt, I was very much like you. I, I like I tried to watch the other shows. You know, I have a great story about how I found Buddy Mike because like, I was I I was following a, somebody who was older than me that had graduated and moved to New York and got on a soap opera and you know she was the first one you know and 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 um it, it was a, another world and but I didn't real I, I thought it was getting right so I just started watching getting right just so I could, I could find her and and she never showed up but oh my god you did Jerry and you know it was right around that time it was like I probably saw that first scene and and then I was hooked and then I went and tried to watch the other shows Oh, okay, great. But you know, nothing. Guiding like this said it. I think we've always said this, Jerry. It's it's about the eyes, right? There's something in coming through the eyes of, of all the characters. You know? <laughs> Maeve and you and Maureen and oh gosh. Yeah, you're right about the eyes. There are a bunch of eyes there. I mean Maeve was like she, she was so quiet and still. Yeah. But you still look quiet and still. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Back then, for that age group, we were in our 30s. It was really something. And we had some wonderful sets. I mean, the first set they built for me for where I lived, it was fantastic. It must have been you know, 30 yards long. It was huge. They could do sorts of, all sorts of great camera work. And I remember that even every time I, was, I met Maeve at the door, they had a camera above us. It was it was wow. fantastic, man. Then to have rehearsal on top of that, I thought I didn't know how good I had. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Rehearsal. Imagine um, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta say, I'm I'm just I'm just in awe because I'm here with two of uh, two classic guy like legends here. I got Ross and Blake on the guy on like super couple and to think you know Kaliz, I know when you came on you took over for Sherry Strangfield who had played Blake before and, and when you came on it was just like wow it was like a, 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 a interesting love story and then this was going on and Ross running for, for the Senate. Yeah oh yeah. <laughs> and Roger was primarily well, him. storyline ever. Really, that, I mean, I go back and watch some of those beginning scenes. And it just, you know, we said this before, Jerry. It's, it's. There was this. You just all you had to do was walk into a room, and there was a scene without anybody even speaking. There was so much going on. Um, you didn't even need the words. <laughs> um, that was really well, well, <laughs> through and. They had a lot of good writers back then that could do that. That was their aim. To before a word was spoken, something was happening. And uh, if you walk into a room with, uh, with Liz and Michael Zaslow, and I came in, I mean, before anybody spoke, it was, it was a pretty much attention to them. And, uh, you know, you were off and, and they were well, too. So it was that it was the formula for a good soap back then, as still is now, I think, if they, they were doing. Plus, you know, Liz's career is based solely on. Uh, Tic Tacs. <laughs> I always had Tic Tacs in my truck or in all the furniture all around. Wow. And if she did well, then she'd get it. 
So what I used to celebrate whenever I started the Tic Tac market. I know. I don't know how that started. <laughs> oh, Jerry, you always provided me. You always had little treats for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. And also another another inside behind the scenes. I you know, I have terrible blood sugar if I don't eat. I mean, it's. It's bad. And Jerry could, after a while, he's caught. My eyes would glaze over. <laughs> he's like, uh-oh, she's not here. And he literally, literally cut treats and, 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 and like granola bars and all sorts of stuff in his dressing room to feed me to make sure that I didn't go, oh. <laughs> it's like I was a trained seal. It was very, that's, one of the many reasons <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> you know, the, the, the time that we got married, speaking of your eyes glazing, I don't know how you did all this power. She, she was really sick. I was burning. We, we had a normal job. I mean, she would have been sent home. But uh, we had so much to do. And we had these vows that we put in ourselves. And, 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 and that always happened. And they were about two, three pages long. And when you're really ill, it's very hard to concentrate. It's very hard to do. Plus, she's in this heavy gown. You know, oh, fever. Yeah, 50 pounds. I don't know how she got through the day. I just remember sitting and plopping. And every, every time that they would have a, a break, you know, and everybody would go run to the coffee machine and go to the bathroom, whatever it is that they needed to do, leave set. You know, and come back. I couldn't move. I was just, I'd be standing with my big 50 pound gown and I would just go down and plop and sit on the floor. And people would come over and bring me a drink with a straw. And I never moved. I was like, that was, yeah, those were, yeah, um, challenging days. But the, yeah. you know, you helped. <laughs> everybody helped. Oh my gosh, everybody's yeah. in crew. I mean, just, Everybody helped. Um, I that's one thing I miss the most. I think is the day to day planning with the with all the, with the crew in every department. We we just had such an amazing family. It was a very light place to work. Yeah, I, I, I mean they were serious. Yeah, I was, I was, was serious. I was, like you know, sorry, it was. It was and I, a lot of that had to do with our directors and our stage managers. Uh, the, you know, the floor was always, you felt free. You felt it was okay to make a mistake. But it was a lot of fun in terms of, there was so much laughter on this. On this and very few divas made it into the, the guiding light class. Mm. I, 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 Betty Ray would spot that in a minute. She didn't want to upset the uh, emotional temperature of the show, which was uh, a great place to act because you weren't afraid. You know, I've been on, and so it's Liz, where the only goal is to not make a mistake. <laughs> that leads to some boring acting. So. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Two. Um. Yeah. I, I, whenever I talk to anybody about the show. Uh, uh, maybe Tina Sloan, who I'm uh, good friends with, um, she actually sent me um, a copy of both her books. Um, I always say that whenever I watch Guy and Light, different periods of time later on, that it always seemed like you guys were like a big family. I mean, even though y'all acting hearts out, it's like y'all. I remember talking to Mark Doran in her interview. I remember asking, is there a blooper reel from back in the 90s with you guys? <laughs> oh, with Mark Derwin? Oh, God, I wish. I'd love to see that. Well, 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 well with with, with y'all, with, with y'all in general. I mean, from from guy I like from back in ninety two or ninety three. I mean, like, like in in general. Yeah, it was, uh, one Christmas, I mean, it was, I'm sure it was. They had, they had a movie reel. Did they? Was, they had one where you were a little teapot, short and stout. <laughs> <laughs> no, my hands. I was out and I put my hands on my hips. I think I was. I was. I was trying to, I don't know, demand something of you. <laughs> Man, you listened to me. And that was very funny. That was very funny. A <laughs> little teapot, short and stout. stout. Yeah. I think there was a people meal that they, they created and, and they, 
like sold to somewhere in Europe. I, I remember being having to okay um, uh, sign off on um, using footage. There's a there's a room somewhere. Somebody created one. No, that was a blooper show in the United Kingdom. Is that where it is? And we had to uh, sign a waiver. Yeah. For permission, not well, not not get paid, no. but just permission for them to use the use the outtake. And uh, I think you were supposed to say, "I'm a real estate agent." You said something where you were a different noun or something. <laughs> it no sense whatsoever. And I just said, "No, you're not. You're a little coupon sorting." No. <laughs> Oh, I'm a real estate aide. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> anyway, they didn't. They didn't wow. do which we would have done uh, Mark Irwin out there because you know he had that the dog, with the dog on. and then uh, on top of all that, he's a very funny man. So he, when he would go up and go up means when you can't remember your line. He would always have something else to say that wasn't in the script. It was very funny. Yeah, I wish we had. They did that a lot at ABC. Though. They had all takes that they showed at uh, the Christmas parties. Yeah. Yeah. And you must have had a lot of fun with him at AB, at, at One Life with Mark. Did you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, Mark is, is, is so funny. He's tough to work with. <laughs> It's kind of like a muscle in that way. Yeah. You see the twinkle coming in his eyes. You know, everybody's gone then. <laughs> it becomes a giggle fest then. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know who else was That was um, Justin. Justin Deeds. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God, he was funny. He was very funny. And, and he was Michael O'Leary. <laughs> Put a couple of those people together, and it's yeah, yeah, it's duck. Here comes the hot dog. And also, the um, who was our guy, our Bill? Who was our Bill character? Um, the la um, why am I why am I completely blank? It was just so funny. Um, Matt, Bill, um, say say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the grown up latest bill. Oh, yes. Um, no, um, I'm, well, I'm having a brain freeze because he's just um, he's unbelievable. Uh, um, Daniel Cosgrove? Yes, Danny. Um, yeah. He's yeah. There's also one that I, I, it, once he started going, he was like a Justin D's in that way, and he started improvising and just go, going off and. I, I I had a hard time doing the scene with him. He's also adorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had some good, really talented, funny people. <laughs> um, I got a fan on here. Um, he's a fan of Russ and Blake, and he said that Mr. Mr. Niller, and he said he loved the wedding you had from Christmas 2003. Oh, that was nice. And he also, he also, yeah. <laughs> he he also wanted to ask Liz. He said, "Um, what was it we, we talked about on the last show? Um, um, did you like it? Blake was paired up with Frank? With At Frank?" Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit on my sound, but I think I got that. I think I think it was about being paired up with Frank at the at the end. I um, which was you know, oh, okay. yeah, um, I love yeah. Frank. So that, that if 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 they had to do something, <laughs> um, Frank at least it was it was it was a love a different kind of love. It was a love that came full circle from friends and 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 um you know that that was that was sweet that was it was and and there was history to that um but if Ross and Blake didn't have their ending together which I know everybody was still <laughs> still 
we should just go back and film it <laughs> and give it to people. Um, um, but 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 I love Frank. Frank Frank is a sweetheart, just a sweetheart, and and that he comes from history. That was nice to just. It's like a big warm hug. Yeah, you know, him at the end there. And only Frank would like fall in love with, you know, just, I guess he, his storyline was that he fell in love with, um, not Olivia, but um, uh, um, the, 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 yeah, where the, the two women ended up being together and having his baby. And he was like, <laughs> Like, oh. it was like a rock. That was like the storyline in Friends, right? The awesome. <laughs> life that went off and went with another woman. So that, that we always had like the friendship. Uh, Blake, Blake, and Frank, Blake and Frank always had a, a good friendship. So I I was surprised, but I was also happy at the end that they paired y'all together. I thought that was a good, good parent. You know, I always said that Ross did not die in that plane crash, but he's going to come back from the dead at the end of the show, and he's going to save the day. I, I, I said that one. <laughs> well, they tried to do something uh, in that regard, but ABC was, no. Yeah. I, I, I don't even think it made it to, out of the building. I think uh, I producing said, no, I don't think so. I said, you got a lot of publicity out of it, because I, I would have done a month of... Uh, being on Guiding Light and Moonlight Life Field, and you know, it'd be something to talk about, and uh, but we didn't want to do it, <laughs> so it never happened. That's too bad because it really would have been great. It yeah, I'm gonna come show. back as a ghost. Yeah. First of all, only you could see me, and then a, a few other people, Dinah, who we had to get a Dinah, wanted to see me, and then I went and was supposed to go to Doctor Ed. Well, a good friend, and he could see me. So we found it so interesting and it didn't happen. But, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do as an actor, too. Yeah. And I, I, don't, even, I don't even know if um, yeah. if ABC and CBO talk to each other. But it would have been cool, wouldn't it, Liz? Oh, it, it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It would have been... It would have been so healthy. That's you know for everybody. It, it, it's so, yeah, it would have been really cool. It really cool. I, I think everybody was still waiting for that to the very end. Yeah, yeah. But, and it was uh, it, it was scenes and a source that told me I won't say who it was, but it was a writer. Um, Ross came back to say everything's okay with the kids with me. And with you, and just essentially gave my wife the blessing because she needed to go on with stuff. Right. And, you know, it would have been so sweet. Would have been very sweet, but we can't talk about this because I might start crying. <laughs> and it was sort of, you know, don't know where, don't know when, but I'll see you again. Kind of thing. Right. So, so, I was going to happen, you know, they. Days of Our Lives in General Hospital in the last few years are known for bringing characters back from the dead. So, you know, if they were to the resurrect God in light in some way, I think somehow they can have others show up and be like, I mean, I'm home. It was all a Dallas moment. It was all a dream. I did not die. <laughs> it would be lovely if they ever resurrected it, just to, just to have a, 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 a scene, just a little story to do that. Wow. Boy, would they? This is this is a good yeah. idea. Get this out there. Yeah. <laughs> I would get a lot. The rule was if they don't find the body, you can come back. You know, two years later. But right. that always seems sort of hokey to me. I mean, where have you been? What have you been doing? You know, especially if you do it in today when you have social media and many ways to keep in touch. But having come back as a ghost is not really having them come back. It's so it's not so hokey. And. Uh, it would have been sweet. Beautiful. Okay, let's get on. Um, Jerry, we memories of working. Jerry, we memories of working with um, Tom Rook and 
Chris, who um, both were actors who played your brother Justin Marlowe on the show. Yes, Tom O'Rourke uh, was Justin when uh, I came on. And he was another one of those uh, gigglers. I can remember one time they just, one of the times I was bad on the show, they just, I think it was uh, one of our oldest directors, Len Valente. Did you ever know him? Tom O'Rourke? No, Len Valente. The director, he was gone by the time you got there. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, we were giggling so much and we went up on the scenes and we couldn't get through the scene. I know they just sent it to That was how bad it was. So let's see if you can do this when you come back from one. Well, Tom and I had to go and grim up and try and go through it. We did finally, but it was, it was a big question. He was a very good actor. He was very tall, too. He was six foot five. Yeah. I knew him from outside of Cutting Light. So I knew him out in Los Angeles. I had met him in the, the whole acting community out there. So so it was kind of fun to, um, I was a big fan of his. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish I had worked with him on Cutting Light though. Well, he was, he was a fun guy to work and he, he was the one who found out he got fired by reading the, the breakdown. In, in the wardrobe. This thing's called uh, wow. breakdowns where the whole show is written in prose and then before it turned into dialogue. And uh, so he found out he was fired by reading that it wasn't for the reading. So on the day he left, he hired two bagpipers who escorted him out of the <laughs> Why would anybody fire him? <laughs> we got another executive producer came in and I just, it's just mind boggling to me. I know. I know. What? <laughs> What's the point of that? And it was just, there was no story point really. He just sort of left. I mean, they didn't even do it for a good story. So there you go. Although, man, I must tell you that um, when I was on One Life, I told Elizabeth many times, but uh, I had an actor come up to me in a, in a restaurant scene. And one like the movie says, I was at the funeral yesterday. It was a lot of fun. He said that he had been up there at uh, the funeral and guiding light. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, wow. dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a, I got another, I got another clip with you guys. This is uh, Liz Key for his first day as Blake. Oh, dear. Right here on my phone. I'm gonna turn my phone. It's a nervous wreck. That hair. Oh. Hair. Sorry, I'm talking. Yeah, that's okay. Wow. <laughs> um, that, that, that chemically straightened hair. But yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Do you know, what is your favorite Blake and Ross moment on the show over the years? Do you have a favorite moment of, of Blake and Ross? Oh. Wow. Cause I got, I got another one. <laughs> mm. I, I always like climbing into the hot tub with a suit on. I'm not a swimsuit either. You mean during your dream? Yeah. 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 We had only one, I think we had one backup suit. And there were a lot of lines and a lot of ways for the camera and audio guys to make a mistake. So we had to be sure. And so they said, Jerry, before you climb, I had a I mean, it was a $1,500 Armani suit I had on. Before you get into the hot tub, make sure everything's okay. And then we had a special line that after you say this line, pause for about 10 seconds and we'll edit it out. Pause for 10 seconds so everybody can get their act together and then get in the hot tub and continue with the scene. And once I got in the hot tub, I was just praying you didn't go up or I didn't go up or we had a boom shadow or something. Because 
I was <laughs> and change into our last group. But we made it. Mm. And uh, of course, yeah. the suit was totally ruined from then on because we had chlorinated water and it was warm. So we just put that suit goodbye. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah. And I like that wedding that we had with all the Santa Claus. I like that. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. I like the um, the honeymoon we took on the, um, the the senior citizens cruise. You bu you booked a senior citizens cruise, not realizing it was a senior citizens cruise. And we had the fantasy, the pirate fantasy. Where you were, I remember you swinging through the 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 the, uh, the set while I was lying in a a deck chair. On, uh, that was a big set too. Ooh, like, huge, yeah, yeah. Set. yeah, I went swinging through, and then. After our, we got a dress rehearsal, and between dress rehearsal and tape, I said, wouldn't it be funny if he still had his briefcase? And so they ran up to, you know, props, and they got my briefcase, so I was swinging through the, <laughs> the air, clutching my, uh, clutching my lawyer briefcase. <laughs> That's so brilliant. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love those. That is just, you're such a good sport. <laughs> What was your favorite, Matt? And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just in love here. Just you know, listening to you guys talking about y'all time on the show. I mean, it's, it's I'm enjoying it. And I, I seen that episode. Somebody had posted. Unfortunately, the channel was off now, but he had posted that episode on YouTube. Um, y'all honeymoon episode. It was on YouTube at one. Yeah. Yeah. On. The, the the yeah is there a you so is there no YouTube channel that actually has all the episodes on is that no longer is that no longer exists because I think it existed at some point yeah it's yeah it's, that's that's a channel I'm talking about yeah. if if you want to watch yourself grow old and uh, <laughs> on television on your computer you can still go to YouTube and do it but, um, I don't know how they get it or how they and decide which ones they aim in. They have tons and tons of them from every decade. Right. I've seen, uh, like, I saw one where it's just Ross and Blake's storyline, and they go, they, they, they create all the milestones and all the, the clips that, that are, you know, that give us the, the synopsis for it. But I was just curious if they actually had the full episodes in, in order anywhere. No, I don't think so. No. Yeah. But every time I forget somebody's name, I just go to YouTube and <laughs> and find out. Yeah, yeah. You're so young. Ah. Oh. Oh. Or I go to my favorite book. Wow. <laughs> oh, that book is great. There's a great picture of you. I always like that wedding photo. Um, Jerry, what are your um? Oh, that's. That's the photo I used when I was promoting this uh, podcast for today. That photo right oh, there. That's one of my great. favorite photos of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We sold a lot of these um, books. Like, I'm sorry. I, I was um I was going to say uh you worked with uh four different diners. Um, when I was watching the show, Dinah was off, and Gina came on the show. And my mother had memories of all of them, but she she said Wendy was her favorite because um, she was she took Diana to a whole different dynamic direction. And um, unfortunately, her Diana put a bull in heart just up Blake's brother. Right. <laughs> um, Wendy, right. Wendy, Wendy is Diana. <laughs> when when Frank was playing heart, I loved Cole. that. Was fun working with Frank a lot mm -hmm. and Wendy. Oh my god. She did take on it. Yeah. Did Wendy play it the longest? I seem to be thinking yes. But I think she did. I think, I, I think she did. I know Gina played it for at least two years. And Gina was amazing. Oh my God, we're working with her. Um, but I think I, but Wendy might have just played, you know, she definitely, I think she played it for at least three. And I think she and left together. Right? They got married in real life. Yeah. Yeah. 
her, I know you and Frank were together. Um, yeah, they were. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you you guys you guys worked with uh, Wendy and Gina. What are your memories of working with them? Well, Wendy took uh, <laughs> took the character into a real adulthood. You know, because out of the teen years, and, and she became very, very fun to work with because you had some mature scenes to play with her, and she was still is a really good actress. I, I had an odd day at one night to live one time when, in one day, within one scene, a restaurant scene again. Both Gina and Wendy were in the scene. I forget what Wendy was doing. I'm not sure. The wife of a mayor. But anyway, I look over there and there's two diamonds. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was fun, and I got to have lines with both of them in the same scene. I thought, this is an out of the body soap opera. <laughs> wow, how surreal. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. But both of them uh, took that character to. Uh, to the highest points because uh, before then it was a preteen and a teenager, right? Yeah. Yeah. But when Wendy came in, she offered so much uh, conflict for, for, for Blake because you know, we were pretty much like the same age and I'm supposed to be her stepmother. And I mean, there was just, I, I love the blend of drama and comedy. And, her, and Wendy was such a wonderful comedic actress as well. So. Um, we, we had more interaction when it came to that, so um, that, that was that was a lot of fun for me. By the time Gina came in, Dinah's story had already kind of veered off from Blake a little bit, and so Wendy and I were a little more um, intertwined and combative, and she offered delicious things. <laughs> I remember one particular scene where I had this long speech to Wendy, um, with Dinah, essentially telling her, I've had enough. It's going to stop here. You got to go up or get out. I remember last night, please, Daddy, don't hate <laughs> But anyway, it, Ross had had enough. And I'm going to cut her off at the knees. Oh, you and she was devastated. <laughs> Jerry, I have to say, when you would play those scenes where Ross would go cold, I mean, there's, I don't think there's even act, actor or actress or actor period on the set that wouldn't be, that, that just didn't drop to their knees. When she, if, would you take it away? Take away all that warmth and you just go cold? It's like, oh. <laughs> we, could, we couldn't help but be devastated. Yeah. She was great that way. And then she had her friend um, Marcus, right? Oh yeah, Marcus. Didn't they both come in yeah. together? Yeah. From, from she off in Europe, and they came in, and she was yeah. they were these like avant-garde, you know, artists. Um, that was uh, yeah. That was uh, Kevin Kevin Mambo. Yeah, Mambo, who I saw on Broadway. Yeah, yeah. He's he's wonderful. Yeah, remember Broadway? Yeah, yeah. Oh my, I have a couple friends who have been, you know, that's what they. That was, I have a few friends up here in my town that they commute and from to go into Broadway, and you know, they have families here, and and it's just what a what a culture shock to suddenly be home, home twenty four seven, and have no. No employment whatsoever. Oh, just just awful. Awesome. All the people who had shows opening in uh, March and April and May and never happened. Probably won't, won't happen. Right. So they went to something else. Where they not only lost six to months to a year of employment, but they lost you know, the whole experience of yeah. putting a show on and getting it up and getting it reviewed and run again. Yeah, this is tragic. Yeah. I was supposed to go see the um, company with Beth, and, and and those tickets were, you know, Beth, Beth or Dorn and I. We're we're theater buddies. Like we 
Eighth order every year. I think I get your ticket here. <laughs> it's like, Gary's not going to go. I was like, I'm going. And we meet in the city. And it's just personal now, at least a couple of times a year to meet and, 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 and go see theater. And that's, that's in May. We had tickets for our company um, on Broadway. We were so upset. You have a music man, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have another clip on my phone. This is uh, another moment between... Uh, uh, and Blake, this was a, a interesting turning point for both characters. This was with you guys and Hunt Block, who was Ben Warren. I, I have blocked that one out. Wow. Yeah, wow. Me too. Wasn't I pregnant then <laughs> in real life? <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. Yeah. That was. I, had, you, I believe you just came back from maternity leave. Um, I, I, I can't hear you. Uh, Do you remember that storyline and working with Hunt Block? Oh, yeah. You know, oddly enough, I don't remember that scene. I don't remember doing it. Like, you know what I do remember? Having a big fight with whoever was producing about where the hell did he get a gun? And they had, you know, I never before had this ever come up. I suddenly am walking around armed. <laughs> you know, I'm a carrier. And then I at least had them write a scene where there was something going on at the DA's office, and I was taking it home as evidence, you know. Like something for the audience to go on. Because, you know, all of a sudden, they've known this character for 20 years, and all of a sudden, he out a pistol out of his, you know, his pants pocket. I said, that's. And you'd be taking the evidence. The reason for him to have a gun. Wow. So, you know, that's one of those things where they. Who was producing then? Was it Paul Roush? It was Roush. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I think remember, it you know, Who cares? You got a gun. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I remember oh, going, uh, yeah. asking, <laughs> what was the motivation? Like they they, they, they had moved the storyline up. There was no setup for this. And suddenly one day I just was obsessed over Ben. Like I, I, and I said, what's my motivation? When, where did I? Paul, where did I take this other road? Can you give me something? And he's like, nah, you, you just, you know. <laughs> you, just, you just have to have it. I kept trying to talk. Paul, they're not going to be listening to your story. They're going to be wondering, what did you have done? What's going to have done? And they're not going to be, you know, fully vested into this tale that you're trying to do. But it doesn't make any difference. Um, yeah. Yeah, that one, that one was challenging, that yeah. storyline. It, it just wasn't set up. You see what we had to put up with, Matt? I mean, I mean it wasn't it wasn't all rosy. You know, a lot of times each actor, Peter Simon was this way too. It had to make sense to him. And it had to make sense to his character. You know, wow. to, you know suddenly they had Dr. Ed walk walk into a barn and pull out a machete. I mean, that would be, he would be, you know, like, he was against things that didn't make sense. And I, I was like that a lot. I didn't make a big deal about it, but I did a lot behind the scenes. I didn't want to do it. It's bad news to have an argument on the floor. I always don't. But, uh, you know, if going to them in their office or a small chat in the hallway, 
if that doesn't work, you've got to do something else. And if it gets to the point, sometimes you just have to let it go and do it. You know, a lot of times when you see preposterous things being done, it won't be actually so. Yeah. You have to pick your fights. Okay. Um, 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 Liz, um, I was going to ask you, um, of course, you know, I couldn't, you know, you guys come on. Oh, shit. I couldn't have you guys come on without mentioning, um, what was it like working with, uh, Michael Lazlo, Roger Thorpe, like, what are your best memories of working with Michael? Yeah, He's such a wonderful actor. You know, I, I went and saw, I was, I was looking for something the other day and I actually was going down the rabbit hole on all those scenes in on YouTube. And I saw the scene where he hits, like he, he hits, he hit me. And um, he's just was so powerful. And I know that was really hard for him to do that scene. But, but what more than anything, I saw the scene afterwards where he's sitting just staring into space. He's back at his house. And I know Jenna has to come in and try to help him and he won't he won't respond. And I actually thought that that was even more powerful. Like he was so deeply um, troubled and consumed with you know, everything because he had just met his daughter. So I, I just I, I just loved the complexity that he brought mm -hmm. to the to the character. He was he was intense to work with, you know. I really enjoyed that. I, I, I speaking of, of things having to make sense, he was one of the it had to make sense to Michael before he could fully commit. But once it does, it was a, a, a very powerful performance. And uh, he was especially powerful with uh, the person who's in our thoughts now, Marie Garrett. You know, that early storyline in 77, 78, 79, went through to 82 or 3. That was some really good stuff. I mean, it was like movie quality stuff. You know? They had a, a wonderful chemistry, kind of, that is not sort of romantic, but it was just sort of this emotional twisting that went on. Because they had never thought of himself as a villain. And he would get offended when the, you know, the press would be interview him and always say, how does it feel to play the bad guy? And then all this. And that. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm playing this character as a, a normal human being who's just going after what he wants in each particular day. And whether you determine that to be villainous is, is up to you. But I'm not playing a villain. He's playing misunderstood by other people. And I always, that's a, this is a good way to play it. When you're playing a drunk, don't be drunk. When you're playing a villain, if you're playing a Iago, don't. It's Iago, and that's who one of his favorite characters. We never played it. Oddly enough, I did. But if you're playing Iago, don't set out to be a bad guy. Just set out to do what you want to do. Yeah. And the whole the world, like Iago says, who is it then that says I play the villain? Yeah. He hated, he hated it too, and uh, that's the way Zaz went about his business. And he was, he was very meticulous. As a matter of fact, we always used to make fun of him. Yeah. Well, Liz and I did, not in his presence, but Liz and I did. Like, he was always, is this cup going to be here? Is this cup going to be here when I, okay. No, I'm not going to do it. And he was like that. He was very precise. Wow. He just hated it when the, uh, all the shows started getting rid of rehearsals because he was like things to be where they're supposed to be but he he, he saved my ass the first year i was on the show because uh, he would tell me what to pay attention to and not pay attention to and just focus on the acting and you know this was very helpful to me he's a good guy He was very protective of you, too. Yeah. yeah. 
of, of, he, left of a, he left quite an impact on the uh, guy and like, um, I don't like to live as well after leaving the guy like the first time and um Yeah. Um, um, let me see. What um, Liz? What do you think Blake would be doing today in 2020? Like, what would she be writing a new book or like what would she be doing today in Springfield? Right. Okay. Well, you know, she'd have her own podcast, <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good question. Really good question. Very well, yeah. <laughs> I think she'd be out there. For, yeah. you know, um, she'd be she'd be leading the protests. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, I think Ross would still would come out of retirement. Yeah. And I, I've been following your podcast, Liz. I, 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 I he'd be part of the movement too. I think we're on a delay because I'm. Oh, I lost you again. Yeah, I can't hear you. Oh man. Um. <laughs> um. Can you, can you hear me? You're breaking up. You hear me, right? You hear me? Um. You're you're in and out. Uh, I, can, I can get uh, every other word. Uh, oh, let me see. Yeah. Um, hold on. Let me let me try this. Let me try this. I'm uh this. Switch over to uh to this. Switch over to. There's two of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can you hear me now? Oh yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got off my laptop and now I'm on my phone. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jerry, were you, was it a challenge for you um, taking over as Clint Buchanan of One Life to Live for Clint Ritchie? Yeah, it was. Um, just like taking over Dr. Ed was a challenge for uh, Peter Simon. But uh, I had the help of uh, Erica Slezak. Because you, once you, if you're a major character in a show, and if you're taken from another show and plot, it's like entering a Russian novel in about page 420, and all this stuff has gone on before, and you have no experience of it. Luckily, Erica Stovak has an encyclopedic mind, and she remembered every storyline and every character for all the time that she was on the show. So I had someone to go to to ask for detail, and. Uh, she sometimes told me more than I wanted to know, but uh, she was, that was always nice. But it was hard to do because the audience doesn't accept you right away. Right. Like I've said before, all you have to do is do about a week's worth of really good scenes, and then you start to win them over. But it's, it's hard to do, and if you have a fragile ego, which I really don't, because uh, the audience doesn't like you at first. Yeah. And I would probably be the same way. You know, it's like that 007. That's not James Bond. Where's James Bond? You know, right. it's, 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 that's not Dr. Ed. Where's the, where's the real Dr. Ed? So you have to get over that. <laughs> but if you really terrific scenes with Robin Strasser or Erica Slazak or Bobby Woods, well, then the audience sees that those three people think you're Clint. So eventually they'll think you're Clint. So with the help of cast members. So I made it through. It was all right. I really had a good time after the first six months. <laughs> yeah, I, I did too. Cause you know, like I, like I said, I, I knew you as Ross for number, well, from when I was watching the show as a kid and um, like many others, I was really, really surprised and upset when they let you go on God and Light. I know that was the time when a lot of actors was, taken off contract. Uh, Liz, you was taken off two years before he left with Maureen Garrett and Beth Chamberlain. And then Jerry, you was taken off and then you went to One Life, which I've, I've been watching that since 2002. And I was like, Jerry got this. He, he's he's going to make a good Clint. 
And I, I loved all the scenes you did with Erica and Robin. I think one of the, the interesting points for me as you as Clint was when they made Clint bad and they, you found out Rex was your son. And, and um, they did kind of the, later on, they did the kind of uh, heaven and hell moment when one life was ending and you ended up in hell and you was with Crystal Hunt, who had played Lizzie on God and Light, and then oh. she was stay with you on your own one life. Right, That's right. brilliant. And a former Guiding Light director was directing. So it was, it was, once again, it was a very weird thing. But the one good thing, one good argument I won at One Life to Live was uh, when, when they called me in after I got the part and, and we were talking about it, and I said, I don't want to play, I don't want to copy Clint Ritchie, who I knew. Uh, rest his soul. But I said, what I do want to do is I want to be like Asa. Because so many men and turn into their fathers and so many women turn into their mothers that it's a common experience. And I said, Ace is bad. Me too. <laughs> I'm going to be Asa Jr. And, that, and that's the way I wanted to play. And it worked out. And then, of course, Phil Carey died. And so they killed off the Asa character. And they yeah. always had uh, me talking to his his photo up on the up on the mantle above the fireplace. And I said, every time I do this, and I, and I have a feeling I would do it a lot, and I was right, I want to put a bourbon and water glass right next to his photo, and then I'll do the scene. And then, and then it started going because little Matt, you, you remember him, Matt? I wanted yep. to go into Clinton Jr., another the third ace in the world. So I had this idea, and they bought it for I bought Matt instead of being a goody goody with the Bobby Woods character. I gave Matt, uh, Matthew a pair of cowboy boots, and influencing him, and so he could be ace of the third after I leave. So I, I yeah. and they agreed with all that, and I, I thought it worked out very well. Wise choices. <laughs> yeah, because I love all, I love all of you. you want to do is cop, try and copy the person who played it before you. Right. And uh, and there's it can people can be replaced, you know. If that weren't the case, only one person in the universe could play Hamlet, and we couldn't do Hamlet again. Because, but you know, that's not that's not true. So, and I wish that the online series had gone on for one more year because yeah. the year had already been written and there was some really great stuff. Talking about Clint disappeared for a long period of time on, uh, he disappeared into a bottle of booze for a long time in the first year. And then in the second year, he had gone missing. And in the first episode of the second year, Erica Slasek, uh, as Vicky wakes up and goes like this in the bed and, and, and Clint's sleeping right next to her. He suddenly appears, and oh, it's wow. just some great stuff. And Reva, Kim Zimmer, and Erica Slazak had some of the greatest scenes I've ever seen. I, yeah, I, I come, you know, steals away uh, her boyfriend, and Erica finds them in bed together. And I thought Erica was going to disembowel this person because these two actresses, she just laid into Kim like, oh, this is wonderful. Chilling. Such great stuff. I'm just, sorry it ended. Yeah, I, I remember that scene really well. I, I remember when it first aired, laughing my head off when Vicky oh. found Charlie and Echo in bed. And she was like, God, you pig, and slapped her. And I was like, oh, they about to have a cat. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> because not long after that, they did the the Nikki and and the, the, the story. All that came out after not long after that. <laughs> Erica Slazak, as they say, have some long knives. And when she yeah. pulls them out, they're pretty, they're pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah. That warm, wonderful human being can just <laughs> become very tough. Mm-hmm. I know someone you, else like that. <laughs> now, when One Life to Live ended, I was in college, and I got to confess, Jerry, 
I not hard hard, but I kind of slapped my television because when one life ended, y'all ended with a cliffhanger with you proposing to Vicky, and that's how the show ended. I was like, oh come on now, I want to know is Vicky going to say yes to Clint or was she going to say no? But then y'all went to the online with Prospect, and y'all was, you know, together at that point because you know I, Vicky. I think was the only woman on the show who didn't have a lot of love lives on there, but she, you and Vicky always was a good match. And um, I loved your scenes with Erica next to next to Liz Kiefer, of course. I loved your scenes with uh, Erica. So it's like that was that was good. And I remember laughing too at a point where you had you had a shotgun to Bo and Nora when you found out they had an affair, <laughs> and you punched him. <laughs> Yeah, Clint was drinking a lot. <laughs> so, you know, Liz, Liz was uh, on One Life to Live. Yeah, Vicky played Vicky. One of her love affairs was with Frank O'Neill, who my fa my father, my I I was one of the three O'Neill sisters. In fact, Kristen Vigard played my sister in that, and she right. was from Guiding Light. So it was. So she played my younger sister. I was the middle sister. And Vicky was having a, an affair or a relationship with my factory worker father, Frank. Wonderful, wonderful actor. Um, and he was great. So that was kind of, and that was the only time I had an opportunity to work with her. But it was it was fun because I was on, from the other side of the tracks. I was, I was a gold digger. I think I worked with Steve Fletcher. I was. I, I the, with the Vernon Inn. I think I was when, when I when I got to One Life, um, they had a a whole collection of stuff in a room that was it used to be props and then they were no longer props. But they also had photos of actors and actresses who used to be on the wall. And I found one of Liz when she was on the show, hair. And I gave it to you, right? I, gave it. I think you did. You did. You brought it to to oh, the to, to I it an appearance of some sort. Yeah, some something that we were we were. I think so, we took it off. We actually had just been hatched, and yeah. just little girl, big smile on her face. I was pretty yeah. young when I was on that show, and yeah. naive. And let me tell you. Woodsy and Clint Ritchie and those guys had a field day with me. <laughs> yeah. No wonder. But boy, was I gullible. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, <laughs> I love watching your episodes on YouTube, Liz. Um, remember I did the montage from our interview and I had some clips of you guys in it. Uh, yeah. I remember watching those episodes, and um, you had some, you had some uh, pretty different curly hair. You, you had a different hairstyle then, but um, that was, yeah. I, uh, that was the 80s. That was early 80s. I was just fresh out of, yes, the nest. <laughs> yeah. Roush, actually, Paul Roush was the producer during my, uh, well, he came in, he came in during my tenure and that's when he turned it around and he got rid of all of us. And my character went away and came back a hooker. Cause you know, he just was like, no, 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 this is all too, this is all too warm and fuzzy. <laughs> all, all the three sisters. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he totally changed our characters around. I just remember I watched my character come back a year later. I was like, I'm a hooker now? <laughs> okay. Wow. Typical Paul Rush. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, ironically, he went to Guy on Light years he later. Came and, you know, and it was like when he came on, and, and again, and I had already been on the show, established, I'm like, you're not going to make me a hooker now, are you? <laughs> He's always wanted to turn the underbelly. He's like, I want to expose the underbelly. <laughs> I know. So he brought in the whole Ben Warren storyline. He's yeah. like, Oh, I need to know the underbelly of what's happening with Russell Blake. You know? <laughs> I knew he'd gone off the deep end when he came into Guiding Light was was going through all the sets and he came to what was our what was our diner called there? Um, <laughs> Wheel, Wheels and Meals. Wheels on Meals. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, Buzz's place. Uh, 
Company. 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 And he's looking at the set. He said, I want the walls the color of blood. <laughs> what? I know. That's what I said. What? Oh, my God. That's that's so perfect. It be a rough ride. Because mm. he was serious. Yeah. Um, so, Jerry, Liz, um, when are you guys going to write a book about your lives? Um, I can't wait for it to come out, you know. <laughs> well, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. We should write some of this down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on. Uh, good, good idea. I've got, I've got, I've got the seeds, seeds happening right now. And 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 if this quarantine lasts any longer, that's just, that's just how to start. It. Yeah. There you go. Um, Jerry, what what are your memories of working with um, the first Alan Spalding, Christopher Bernard, and um, Beverly McKenzie, the first Alexandra? Yeah, uh, I didn't get to work with Christopher. Chris Bernal was the first Alan. But mm -hmm. uh, the scenes I did have with him, very, he was very strong, very effective, a perfect Alan, and uh, a foil for uh, Beverly McKenzie once she got on. And Beverly had one of the most wonderful introductions on the show with this master ball that we had that went on for a week and uh, every, every night went until 11 at night and, but it was uh, once you saw it on screen it was it was really good and that's how beverly made her entrance and uh, they crossed swords with the uh, chris Bono and they were off to the races after that because they had some good stuff and both of them were very good i'll tell you one small thing about beverly mckenzie she was on almost all the time and right. so she would go home in the weekend. She'd have five scripts, and she'd memorize them backwards. She'd memorize Friday, and then Thursday, and then Wednesday. And Thursday. I never figured it out. But she was one of those people. She never, ever forgot a line. I never saw her go up. She's just memorize like Memorize them backwards? Yeah, I don't. I should have asked her, but I shouldn't. I was intimidated. I'm just so curious about that because, I mean, maybe that it just kind of gets it in, it gets it into your fi files in your head. Yes, I guess. And Whatever she's and done. One of the few, to, few actors, she memorized, if, it, it was perfect. Whatever was on the page came out of her mouth. She didn't change stuff. We change stuff all the time. Yeah. But, but we are hate it we always would change it we'd say what we wanted and then we'd we'd show them you know yeah. pretty we could never change the intent of a scene and we never did but right. we would change uh i mean you couldn't take a sad song and make a sad scene and make it into a, a comedy scene but we didn't want to do that anyway we just changed things because we knew what was better and we knew what was fluff and shouldn't be in there let's get to the point come on <laughs> well a lot of it would show it instead of say it and later on i found out that the reason beverly said everything what's on the page was that she had a great deal to do with writing it so oh, oh. Okay. didn't have many arguments with what came out on the page well, that'll do it yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. You also um you also had Jane Elliott. Um she was Carrie. Um Crazy Carrie, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they did they brought uh, Doug Marlin brought her on and uh they essentially stole Three Faces of Eve and they did that movie on Guiding Light. <laughs> they had the different uh personalities for Carrie and and oddly enough, Jane had several personalities of her own, so it worked out quite well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Wow. Yeah. yeah, well, like me dead, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was a long running storyline. And uh, we had a wedding. I actually married her. But she was she, your only other wife, right? On the show? Yeah. You never married Vanessa, just was a love. No, never did. Right, right. Um, and, you know, oddly enough, for being on the show that long, to have married only two people, that's pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, Carrie and Blake, because you didn't marry Holly and you didn't marry Vanessa. I was engaged to Vanessa, we, uh, but in, we never had a wedding. Yeah. You've had, I remember looking at your page um, before doing this, and I said, Ross had a lot of different females over the years. He was a lucky guy. What, what am I missing that I don't have some ladies, you know, <laughs> in my direction? <laughs> yeah, I got lucky. And every time uh, they bring a new person in, uh, it didn't settle down really until the blackout. And then I quit getting all these ladies that settled on the wonderful yeah. Yeah. But the blackout sort of established a lot of people. Yeah, yeah I think the, my favorite moment of that storyline, other than Blake and Ross, was the upcoming leading storyline between Lillian and Ed, which later oh, yeah. on to Maureen's exit from the show. Because <laughs> they had something going on during the blackout as well. Um, I gotta say, Jerry, the only lady that you worked with that I was not, I was so so about, but they paired y'all together was when Ross was temporarily dating India back in 1999. Uh, Mary oh. Adams came back to the show briefly and he was with Ben and he was with India because India was with Philip. So it was like, okay, Ross and India, well, but you know, y'all two got back together at the end anyway. And yeah. Blake gave birth to uh Carissa. Carissa. Uh, yeah. Well, I was earlier today. Kevin. I blocked that out. I blocked that out too. So I yeah, it was sort of uh I don't know whose idea that was, but it was not a it didn't work. Probably yeah. my fault, but because I wasn't too enthused. So <laughs> I didn't try my hardest to make it work. So yeah. But the, you know those things happen if you're on uh, five days a week, fifty-two weeks a year, and you know you're doing all these different stories, and you're got people who've been on the show for years. You know, some some weird stuff is going to happen, right? no matter how vigilant you are. And every once in a while, something would sneak up, like uh, oh, let's say Ben, let's say India, let's say you know those things happen. Yeah, because you got different regimes coming in, and they of course want to bring in their people and their ideas. And, so to master any sort of large continuity, you have to be, uh, like I say, vigilant about what's going on day to day. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going, well, I know I was on my computer when I talked to y'all, now I'm on my phone, so I'm going to turn it around. This is uh, one last uh, clip I have of uh, Ross and Blake. It was a party that Ross was at with Ed and others and Blake, uh, Liz, you made quite an interest at this at this event here. I'm going to turn my phone around. I think I know what Every time I'm imagining myself being married to a woman who's capable of doing it. Can y'all see it? Am I coming out of a cake? You the cake, yes. <laughs> I can hear it. I don't need to see it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the cake, and then little Billy, which is Brian Buffington, who now has you know family of his own now, is up to up, 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 standing. His head is like right at my chest because I come out of a cake in my lingerie because I want to say hello to you. I'm I don't know. I need to know what's happening in at your at your party. Yeah, <laughs> you traumatized that young man. For <laughs> I, I, for a while, every time, every year on his birthday, I would send him a picture of that. <laughs> Just remember, <laughs> you win. Wow. <laughs> I, I need to ask him about that because I, I interviewed him uh, a month ago, actually. Oh, yeah. He was he was on my show as well. Um, him and um, um, Katie Parker, Denise Pence, she was on here as well. But um, I need to talk to him about that scene and see if he remembers that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That was funny. Yeah, that was, yeah. Funny. that was one of my favorite clips of uh, 93. And Jerry, I remember telling Mark one of my favorite moments of 92 with you guys was when y'all did Ham's Bachelor Party. It was the all-male show. Oh, yeah. Oh. 
I always enjoyed those uh, bachelor parties. Then they had the, we had one episode where it was men only. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those, those, those were good times. Uh, yeah. I can't remember who the executive, oh, it was, it was, uh, who's Jill. it? Was Jill, right? Yeah. 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 Aaron Phelps. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you and Peter had some of the most great scenes over the years. I mean, you two were like the best uh, bro bromance on the show, if I can put it that way. Um, Cause you two had some of the most funniest and brotherly like moments. Even if, you know, Ross had a bad day, he would talk to Ed. If Ed had a bad day, he would talk to Ross. Or, and somehow y'all would just talk about it and it would just work. I mean, I, I really, that that was really I, I felt that was missed from the show in the later years. Cause I know Peter was gone at had left the show in '96 um, at this point, but um, I, I liked y'all scenes together over the over that time. You know, I have a really a good soap has those kind of. Not everybody have to be lovers. I mean, it's it's fun to set loose the younger storyline and everything, and that's part of the soap. But also part of the soap is is friendships ladies and men <clears throat> and the friendship I had with uh, with Dr. Ed was it was deep stuff I mean it was meaningful and uh, it was usually well written and if it wasn't between the two of us we made it well written and uh, it was the audience I get a lot of comments like that still today and they really liked the friendship of Ed and Ross and uh, it was a meaningful part of about a decade and a half. And it was good for both of us. It was yeah. soothing. I found, I found all those scenes soothing to listen to. It's like very comforting. <laughs> really, which is what, what part of the, what made a good story and a good soap so valuable, you know, for, you know, for any age. I, I, and I, and even as a younger person, I love watching the older, the older generations, you know, talk and what they're going through. And, and, and it was, I learned a lot and, but I soothing is, is the word that coming up in my head, you know, you and, you and Peter. And if, if Ed and Ross were talking about another storyline, it would give depth to that storyline when you got back to the, the people who were in that storyline. And uh, that's, that was one of the strengths of driving life throughout the years, I think. That uh, it would, they had, it wasn't just casual scenes, they had a lot of depth to it. And that, they, that was taking advantage of a soap strength. If you want to tell a storyline, we could tell it in real time. You yeah. don't get it in the movie, you, know, you don't get it anywhere else. But because we're on all the time, except Saturdays and Sundays, you, you can tell a story and then give it great depth and people can say, Oh yeah, I remember that. And that was back six months ago. And then that, it's just wonderful stuff. And when the show was really going well, a lot of that was happening. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I did appreciate that they brought Peter back in the shows last year and the scene that Liz had it at your gravesite. Peter oh, walked in. And Peter was like, Ross was always a good listener. <laughs> it's amazing. And that's what they did instead of, it was supposed to be a scene where I was talking to Ross, uh, you know, I, and um, so they just rewrote, they rewrote it for me talking to, at the gravesite, and then, and then Ed's behind me suddenly and I, I turn around and he's there and then it's just like an opportunity just to, oh, love it. And he and for him to listen and to help me and I mean it was it was beautiful it was that 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 was beautiful um, yeah. yeah and he does he he lends credibility and groundedness and gravitas to everything so yeah and Liz I I gotta say I I think I mentioned this when we was talking last time but um I always consider you and you're working with Harley and Mel y'all was like the Charlie's yeah. Angels. They were fun. Good yeah. Girl. One, yeah. one fan was asking, are you still in touch with Ivana and Beth today? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. They both live in the same town right across the river from me. So, um, yes, I, I am. And um, they're wonderful. 
there's a few of us that are all in the same area, as is Orla Cassidy. And um, um, well, Tina's now gone to Florida. She's back and forth from Florida. But yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there we were the god, we called each other the, we had the goddess dressing room. In fact, we all had the same dressing room at, at when we moved to um, CBS. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, we called it the goddess dressing room because, you know, when in Rome. <laughs> yeah y'all y'all was so dynamic um i remember one time when i was a kid watching god in light i remember saying um you know i would love to be like ross because ross being a lawyer and he always won all his cases majority of the time always said i want to be like ross because ross was like a good pillar to the community of springfield um, cause I, th I thought at one point it was going to do like another storyline again where he ran for Senate, um, even though they didn't, but I always thought Ross was a good pillar and a good advisor for the next generation, both of y'all. And, um, I've often said that, you know, I'm going to find me a redhead. Hopefully she don't jump, jump out of cake this time, but I'm, I'm a <laughs> redhead. I'm going to run for Senate and, um, hopefully, uh, you know, Hopefully nobody like uh, uh, Alan Michael shows up in the picture. <laughs> Yay for you. Good on you. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, I do want to thank you guys. You know, you guys um, were a big part of my childhood watching Guy and Light all those years. And um, I was disappointed when the show unfortunately ended on April Fool's Day. On top of that, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, you, I know you was on One Life, but what was your reaction when you heard the show was ending? Well, didn't they, they end it at the same time? I mean, world turns. Well, the, the, the cancellation came on April Fool's, like when it was announced. And then we, and then we had six months. They, like they said, it's canceled. And then they gave us six months to, I think we had till August to play it out and, and finish it. And then World Turns uh, was canceled a month, went off the air about a month after Guiding Light. So, but Guiding Light went out, went off in August 1st. But, um, they were first to go off and then, and then World Turns. Yeah. I don't know when World Turns was when they announced it. I just remember April Fool's, it being the announcement. Yeah. Uh they ended the following year in 2010 because that was that was the same year i graduated from high school and um and then the following year came children in one life yeah, yeah. yeah. well um, and all the things that replaced it was, i don't know it's on cbs anymore but uh, the show that replaced one life to live lasted uh, four months yeah i mean one life lasted four decades and this dude with I mean, it was a show about how to organize your closet and everything. It was, it was very weird. It was called the Revolution. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then all my children was replaced by the Chew, which, which I thought was the most dumbest name I've ever heard. I was like, "What is the Chew? Am I taking a chew out of a bite? Like, you know?" <laughs> I know. It was just so tasteless. But they're gone, and you know. So. Yeah. But I knew the, the I and mean, I always used to talk about this how TV was disintegrating into niche audiences. Because so, when I came on the show in New York, there were the three networks, two independents, and Channel Thirteen and Twenty One. That was it. And you know, when I left the show, there was like you had your choice of four hundred channels. So. In, let's say on a Friday in 1979, we had 10 to 12 million people watching the show. Same thing on Monday. That's enormous. Major League, the World Series doesn't get that. The only thing that tops that is Super Bowls and the playoff in, the, in football. So it was a decline in uh, the audiences. And we made more money for CBS than we were like a money tree. And we paid completely for the CBS News worldwide and it was just a cash machine yeah. and, uh, you know technology changed everything and uh, 
now if you can get 800,000 people to watch something, it, it's a grand success. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So it's, yeah. business changed out from under us, that's all. But how hey, many you know, times can you watch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember being so um, sad when you when guy like ended um like i said i was in high school at the time and um kyle was you know because you guys have been on for so long it was like how do, how can you take off a show and put a game show or a talk show in place you can't do that but unfortunately they did that and i was like you know how how can you do that this show's been on you guys were on you know past cheers and er laverne and shirley dallas you know guy might been on for for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was like, how how can you take off a show and put something? You can't do that. You know, let's let's go to Procter and Gamble and do something. But yeah. you know, unfortunately, yeah. you know, that happened. And um, you know, it's but, about values. It's about they just had a different decided they were didn't need to have it anymore. So yeah. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah. Hey, I hate to say this, but I have to run. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually have an anniversary to attend to today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, my plan was to have you guys on for an hour, but you know, we just, you know, like I said, I never, I never like to rush my guests when I bring them on because you know I love hearing the stories, but you know, we was. I had one fan on who said, Matt, keep them on as long as possible. <laughs> I, I can listen to them talk for two days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, Liz, Jerry, thank you for coming on my podcast. Well, Liz, thank you for coming back to my podcast. And okay. Jerry, thank you for coming to, coming aboard. Um, I would love to have you guys come back uh, again. You know, I could, there's a whole lot we, we could still talk about. Well, maybe you know. with Maureen, when we can get her. Yes. On better days when Maureen is free yeah. and safe. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank um, you. And happy anniversary, Liz. Thank you. Are you going to cook dinner? What? Are you going to cook dinner? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bobby's job. Why change now? <laughs> it's 24 years. Why break a, why break a no good thing? No. <laughs> I'm gonna go. All right, thank you. Talking with you guys, I love you guys. And Jerry, I gotta say to you real quick though, I always looking at the clips of you and Roger back in 1979. I always thought Ross could have went to Dallas and helped Jr. Ewing when they did the Who Shot Jr. storyline. I always thought he could have went to South Fork at, at one point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. It's nice. All right, yeah. have a good one, guys. Yeah, you guys have a good day, and thank you, guys. God bless you. You too. <laughs> Bye. See you, Liz. <laughs> well, guys, um, it's been a blast doing this podcast. Um, thank you, guys, for um, listening. I'm gonna hit the full note there. It is. Um. Then and again, uh, I'm going to hopefully we'll have, I'll have Jerry and um, Liz back on again and plan to. And then um, next week, I want to have, um, well, we got to pick another day, but Carl Evans is going to come on. He was originally an animal for Spalding in uh, 87 to 90. He's going to come on board. And um, later on, I'm going to have uh, a Disney animator come on as well later today. But um, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, Anybody that's a fan, um, go to my Facebook page. Uh, my name is Matt Paris. Um, go on there and just tell me the favorite Ross and Blake moment that you remember the most. And he's in the next. Um, I'm telling some of this. But, um, thank you guys. Hopefully, somebody send me a message on Facebook. And, um, until next time, have a good one. Good day.